I have the pleasure this afternoon of introducing you to your next presenter. And this is Dr. Ijoma Ononuju, and he comes to us from um, Toro University. He holds a PhD in education. His emphasis is in language, literacy, and culture from UC Irvine. He's passionate about serving youth, families, and communities. He's currently the chair of equity, diversity, and inclusive education in the Graduate School of Education at Toro University, which is here in California. He is also the co-founder of Black Dem X, and I apologize, I don't know how to say that, but it's a weekly podcast engaging educators across the nation in critical dialogue about academic success for African American scholars. Today, he is going to share with us, but also engage us in a discussion about some of the inequities that exist in our work that we oftentimes are challenged to identify and acknowledge. And with that, I want to welcome. Dr. Onanuju, thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate it. I uh, wanna uh, real quick, just a few things. One, uh, I actually graduated from UC Davis and so I wanna give a shout out to my UC Davis uh, family that, that may, may be logged on with us today. Um, and then thank you for, for the bio. Uh, the uh, the project that I'm working on is called Black Academics. Uh, we're making a play on the word academics. Uh, we've we've added an X on there just to make it a little bit more uh, urban and hip. Um, but it is a game show that highlights uh, teachers who are competing to see who's the best. And so they come on my show and much like a lot of the different uh, competition shows that you see out there, we give them a number of challenges. And then at the end of the day, we let the students decide who the best uh, teacher is. So it's just a lot of fun opportunity to provide some academic enrichment for our youth in a way that they don't even know that is happening. Um, so, um, but today, uh, we are here to talk about critical equity. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen uh, with you all. Can everyone see my screen? Let me move to uh, probably slideshow. It's probably a better view for you all since uh, since we are are in this this form. Here we go. So um, critical equity is, is something that I've been working on uh, for the last few years, uh, particularly as you know, we have really made a shift and a move towards um, equity and, and, and really ensuring that we are creating diverse, equitable and inclusive environments. Um, a few years back when I was in grad school, I actually referred to equity by a different name. Uh, I called it grace back then. And uh, if, if any of you are familiar with the concept of grace, then you will see that there are a lot of parallels between grace as a um, Christian concept and equity as an educational concept, right? And so I, uh, this is, when we talk about equity, this is something that is near and dear to my heart, um, but I've been taking it another step further in, in terms of talking about critical equity. And so today I wanna just kind of take a few moments to engage in this conversation with you and hopefully you will get something from this conversation that you could take back to your respective institutions. Um, so we're gonna start with a little JDA. Uh, I wanna get us a little JDA in the conversation today. Um, then we're going to talk, touch briefly on some dominant assumptions and ideologies that govern how we approach the work. Um, I will define equity, uh, and then we'll talk about how do we move from this idea of practice to what I call ethos, right? How do you make it to where equity is something that you live and breathe? Uh, so much to the point that I always say this. 
equity is not just something that we practice. Like I want to go and I want to grocery shop with equity. I want to pump my gas with equity, right? Like, like I want to walk my dog down the street with equity. And the truth of the matter is, is I can actually do that. When we get to a place where everything that I do is infused with equity, that's when equity has become a part of our ethos, meaning that I don't have to wait for someone to tell me how to be equitable because every moment that I live and breathe, I am breathing out equitable outcomes. And so uh, that is kind of like my challenge for all of us is to strive to get to that place where equity is a part of, of who we are and, and, and what we do. Uh, I want to say just on the front end, when we talk about the, the growing roses from concrete, I'm going to talk about it from a specific angle, but some folks might say, why aren't you starting with the definition? Uh, and, and I don't know, this is just kind of my own personal style, but sometimes I, I like to start us with, it's almost like Spanish. You know how Spanish you start with the negation before you give the word, right? I'm kind of starting with, with some of the things that, that I think we have to be careful of before we get into defining equity. And so hopefully um, you all don't mind that and, and are able to follow along with me as we go through it. So growing roses in concrete. Uh, there's just a few concepts that I wanted to take from uh, Jeff Duncan Andrade's article um, that he wrote back in 2009 as part of the Harvard Ed Review. And that's this idea of hokey, mythical, and deferred. And the reason why I wanna start off here is because I wanna challenge us as we are doing equity and whatever version that we're doing it, whether it is just something that we're practicing, whether it is something that we're living, right? That we're not doing it in ways that are hokey, mythical, and deferred. And so we're just real briefly, I wanna just touch on what this means because I guarantee when you do an examination of equity in your life. I'm not saying necessarily you personally, but when you do an examination of the supposed equitable systems in your life, I'm sure you're gonna find some traces of these, what we call enemies of equity, right? And the challenge is, is how do we root them out to make sure that we're approaching critical equity and not just equity for show? Let, let, let me give you a, 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 a practical example of what I mean by this. Uh, some of you are in the sports, some of you are not, but I'm gonna just use a sports analogy real quick. The NFL uh, is starting their training camps over the next couple of weeks, right? And they have this policy where if a player holds out for more money and they don't come to training camp, uh, they get fined $50,000 a day. Right. To me, that's like a hokey punishment because we know at the end of the day, the team is going to pay for the penalty. Right. They just want the player. So you're saying we're going to we're going to penalize you fifty thousand dollars. But in actuality, are you really penalizing me or is that just a policy for show? So that when the fans look and they say, oh, they have a policy for this, but the policy really has no teeth behind it. Right. That's what I'm talking about when, I, when I'm talking about these different types of enemies of equity. So the first one is hokey equity, which is informed by privilege and rooted in the optimism of the spectator who surveys the quantitative evidence in order to infer that things are getting better, even when the qualitative does not warrant such conclusion. I'm a qualitative researcher, even though at my heart, I love math. Math has always been my favorite subject, and I would rather sit in a math class than any other class uh, in the world. However, quantitative evidence sometimes masks the truth that qualitative evidence exposes. It's really, really easy for me to say that my program is, is diverse or that my program is equitable when I can put numbers in front of you that say, see, we have an African-American or see, we have a person of this ethnic or see like we, 
But when we get to the spirit of it, when we get to the qualitative experiences of those who supposedly are benefiting from this diversity, they have a totally different story that they're telling. Maybe their story is, is yes, like numbers wise, we are very diverse, but we're not very diverse in terms of the different ideas and thoughts that our program are allowing. Or numbers wise, we look diverse, but when I brought my authentic self to the table, I was told that I needed to change, that I needed to be different, that I needed to fit in, right? Qual quantitative evidence can be very, very deceiving, but we also understand that quantitative evidence is used to get money, is used to create a narrative that really keeps folks from diving in deeper into the qualitative evidence and saying, okay, what's really happening here, right? And so hokey equity to me is when we're just doing things to make the numbers look good, but on the ground where our, our, our students are really operating at, there is no substantive changes there for them to where they're experiencing what this equity is supposed to do. And I wrote this, I said, what is true often hides behind the front. I do a lot of community work. And so forgive me when I say this, but one of the things that I've learned about trauma over the last few years is that there is typically a beautiful front that covers up the trauma that lives in a young person's life, right? Some people call it a smile. Some people call it other. But the reality of it is, is that behind the quantitative, right, there's a whole nother story, a whole nother deeper level of what is really happening. And I feel like that doesn't just happen in our personal lives. It happens in our professional lives as well. So I wanna say at the outset, let's be careful of hokey equity. The next one is mythical equity. Uh, mythical equity is a false narrative of equal opportunity where we discuss equity through the lens of fairness and equality, but use cultural assimilation and compliance as gatekeepers. That's, that's, a, that's, that, that, is, that is heavy there, but, but I think it needs to be said in this moment, right? Is that if we're really talking about equity, then I have to be willing to have individuals, communities, cultures around me that don't necessarily make me comfortable. If the only way you could participate in my equitable initiative is if you make me completely comfortable in my own skin, then that means I'm really not practicing equity. I don't know what we would call that, right? But the reality of it is, is that we have to push through this conversation of what is fair and equality and push towards what do people need based on their individual context. And whether it looks fair or unfair to someone else, that's not my problem. It's simply about what do you need and am I requiring you to give something to me in order for me to give to you? It's amazing to me how often when it comes to equity, we have to receive something in return before we give it. It would be nice to be able to offer this program to you, but in order for you to do this program, I got to get a guarantee on the front end that we're going to get what we want, right? Because it would be a shame if equity was free, but it often comes at a cost and not a cost to us, but a cost to our clients, a cost to our students, right? And so that's mythical equity. The last one that I want to just cover real quick is equity deferred, which is a common justification for us as supervisors for poor supervision. It hides behind misinterpretations of material challenges or what is happening on the ground, as well as the constraints of the university. The reality is that many supervisors feel overwhelmed by all the things that we're asked to do. And some of us even feel 
ill-equipped to respond with supervision that will foster equity in the face of such daunting hardships. Here's the key that I really want us to, to focus on because this was the hard pill for me to swallow, but I realized that I was doing this and I hope that, that some of us in here recognize this in ourselves. We are liberal minded enough to avoid blaming the victim, turning instead to blaming Trump or blaming COVID or blaming the economy or violence or social systems or any other thing that we can blame. And the result is we hope for equity, but we always say we can't provide it until X, Y, and Z is addressed. And I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here and, and that all of you know what I'm talking about, but I know you've heard this from your, your, your organizations, from your universities, from somebody where you was like, hey, we need to do this because this is what's gonna help our student. And they say, well, we can't do that until. And it's like, until what? My students now need this, not tomorrow not next year, not when the new university president comes in, not when we make a switch in, like equity cannot be deferred. It has to be done right now in the present. And we can't be so high and mighty that we avoid addressing the real problem, which is, hey, we got all the excuses in the world not to do the work but we're not finding enough reasons to do the work. And the work is hard. I'd be the first person to tell you the work is extremely hard. And there are days when I don't want to live equity, but that's why equity has to become a part of your ethos because if it becomes a part of your ethos, you will live it without even knowing it. When it's something that's just a practice, every time you do it, you have to think about whether or not you wanna do it first. All right, I'm gonna go back. Remember I told you I did things a little bit out of order. So I'm gonna go back real quick. Here are some assumptions and ideologies that govern our work. Uh, I've been using this, this article for the last few years uh, about the industrial age assumptions, but I see it in our credential program still, right? We look at some of our students that come into our programs as deficient and we have to fix them. I, look, I'm gonna just be real with you all because I feel like you all uh, want the honesty today, but I'm black. I don't know, you know, some, somebody may not know that, but, but I'm, I'm black. I'm also 300 pounds, but we'll, we'll talk about that another time, right? Uh, but, you know, as a black person, I, I feel like sometimes I become invisible in our credential programs when we're talking about other black students. You know, sometimes you, you get so familiar with your colleagues that you forget that your colleagues are coming from a specific community or perspective or point of view. And so sometimes I'm in these meetings and we're having conversations about our students and we're having conversations particularly about students of color and we talk about them as if they're broken. We list all the things that they can't do coming into the program. And the conversation is all about like, oh, we gotta give them this, we gotta give them that because we gotta give them this. And these students came from an HBCU, so we're probably gonna have to support them in this. And they're well-meaning conversations, but those conversations are built around this idea that these individuals are broken and in order for them to graduate from our program, we got to fix them. We got to prepare them to go into the workplace. And it's not from an additive perspective of we have to add on to what they're already able to do. It is a we have to fundamentally change them and get them prepared to work in a professional environment because they're not professional enough the way they write emails, to the way they write papers, to the way they're answering our prompts in class, right? They're broken and we gotta fix them. Some of us are still in this space, especially when it comes to our supervision where 
everybody learns the same way or everybody should learn the same way. That is not beholden upon me as the supervisor to adjust and modify the way that I deal with each and individual candidate because I'm the supervisor and, and they should bend to me more or less than me bending towards to them. I hate to say this again, look, I know this doesn't happen at your, your schools, right? I, I, so I apologize, uh, but it happens at some schools across America where we have conversations about our students in the terms of like, this student is really smart and this student is not. And we are smart enough to not call them dumb, but we call them dumb. Like, let's just be real. Like, we have different ways for calling our students dumb without just blatantly saying that they're dumb because we want to be politically correct and we want to have political cover if somebody actually says we're calling. I didn't call them dumb. I, I said that they were um, lacking in their critical thinking skills. But we know what you were saying, right? And is 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 built on this assumption that's already embedded into our educational system, that some kids or some students can do the work, and some students can't. And what do we do with students who they're great with children, they have a natural ability to teach, but we view them as dumb or deficient because they're struggling with the academic portion of our programs, even though they're excelling at the part of the program which matters the most, and that is educating children. I feel like in some programs, we would rather have the student that turns into a paper, but can't connect with a young person than the, than the student who can connect with a young person, but is struggling in terms of their academic work. A couple other assumptions, meritocracy, what have you done? Janet Jackson made this song back in the 80s. Y'all remember that? What have you done for me lately? Do, 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 do. Ooh, ooh, yeah. That's my singing voice for y'all, right? But that's the meritocracy system. Uh, you get what you earn. Colorblind, race neutral. I feel like we're getting past the colorblind and race neutral uh, piece. That was that was like early 2000s. Now we're, we're starting to move away from that. And then assimilation. Uh, I'm working on a project right now where we are trying to get a cohort of African-American males to go through our credential program. We're trying to get 30, uh, 30 young men to go through our program next year. And the biggest question that I get from them when we're recruiting them is, will I have to change? Like, will I have to dress a certain way? Will I have to change my diction, the way that I talk and communicate? Or can I show up in a t-shirt and some jeans in, in my most comfortable self working in a school or community where the students are gonna recognize me and I not be confused as someone who is unprofessional or someone who is not prepared to come to work or someone who is not a teacher or an adult. Like, can I be myself and come into your program or are you gonna require me to talk different, to walk different, to be different than what I am? <sighs> I think that in some aspects, a lot of our programs still have that, even though we're moving away from it. Eugene, yes. Doma, um, one of the um, participants wants to know the article um, that you're referring to about industrial age assumptions, as do I. It is, hold on, it's, it's on my computer. Give me a second. is written by a gentleman named Senge, S-E-N-G-E, -E, and it is titled, Schools That Learn, by Peter Senge, S-E-N-G-E. -E. And you should be able to, to get it from there. All right, 
Uh, I'm gonna speed it up so we can move into to the discussion. Um, the next part is I like I like really a lot. Uh, I think you all will like it too. First is just our definitions. Uh, but for me, this is how I define equity. While equality means treating every student the same, equity means making sure every student has the resources they need to be successful. Equity is what we do to balance the equation or fill in the gaps. It is unmerited favor. It is meeting the unmet needs of our students. In education, it requires putting systems in place to ensure that every student has an equal chance for success. That requires understanding the unique challenges and barriers faced by individual students or by populations of students and providing additional supports to them uh, to help them overcome those barriers. Essentially, to me, equity is making sure <laughs> it's impossible for anyone to fail. I will say at the outset, right, that if you adopt a mindset that it is going to be impossible to fail, then that means by default two things. Number one, as your supervisor, I'm gonna remove all barriers that can lead to your failure. And number two, I have to come up with a new evaluation system one that removes the idea of failure as a possibility. So if my evaluation system is pass, no pass, if failure is impossible, then I have to get rid of the no pass. If I'm doing a grade-based system, A, B, C, D, F, then I have to eliminate the D and the F, right? And my grading system only then becomes A, B, C. It, it, it is adopting that mindset that you are going to get through regardless. And as I said to a young man just about a week and a half ago, you have to get through because there's a student that needs you as a teacher that is feeling the exact same way you're feeling right now. And if you don't make it through this program, then he or she will never have you as a teacher and so failure, which should be impossible for them, is going to be something that they experience because we didn't do everything we can to make sure that you had the equity you needed to get through our program now. It becomes a domino effect, right? And I never get too far away from understanding that when it comes to, to my students. So here's the, the equity process that I wanna go over with you all, and I promise I'll get through this quick. It's a real simple one, two, three step process. Acknowledge, interrogate, act. This is how I feel we get to a place of critical equity and we avoid those enemies of equity, the hokey, the mythical, and the deferred equity that we talked about earlier. Acknowledge is I'm going to just acknowledge that the problem exists, that there is an equity, right? This seems like a simple step, but there are a lot of folks who don't even acknowledge that this is inequitable, right? And so the first step is I gotta be willing to just say, you know what, you're right, it exists. The next step is, okay, let's do some interrogation. Let's figure out what personally and what organizationally or systemically is happening that is creating the opportunity for this inequity to exist. And then let's build action out of that. Can I go a little bit deeper? Yes, of course. Acknowledge. First begins with self. How am I complicit? And then turns towards the system. I never go immediately to the system or the organization. I always begin with self. I have to, I use this example often, but it's a real example. I had to acknowledge the patriarchy that existed in me before I could begin to change the patriarchy that existed in whatever organization that I was running, working for. So I had to say to myself, in, in what ways am I being foul? Okay, all right, okay, boom. Let me work on that with me and then as a result of me working on me, I can turn and then make contributions to the system. 
So acknowledge self and then system. And then secondly, because I think this is a great question, right? Like, what if you think that everything is perfect? Or you know that the problem exists, but you just don't know where. Data. This is this one. This is the the main thing that I really appreciated about my graduate education at UC Davis is I understood the value of data, and I understood what it meant to actually go find information to tell me what the problem that is happening is. Right, and so I would ask you all to think about this. Number one. What data or which data are you engaging with? And where are you getting it from? So the first is like, are you even engaging with any data to be able to find the inequities that exist in your own supervision and in your program? And then number two, are you getting the data from the right sources? Or are you just taking data that's being given to you without regard of whether that data is creating a narrative for you or actually giving you access to what's really happening in the program? Second step, interrogate. Again, how am I complicit? How are we complicit? What are the things that I can control? What are the things that I can't? Very important questions there. What can I control in this interrogation? And what can't I control? Because the things that I can control, I'm going to work on. But the things that I can't, I'm going to partner on. It's not a matter of we can't control. It's just a matter of I can't. And then the last thing is action. What can I do? Which course of action is most appropriate? And then is it enough? Again, I'm going to take five minutes and go over this last piece and then I'll be done. I promise you. All right. So let me give you, let me give you how this works, right? When it comes to creating equitable practices, oftentimes we acknowledge and then we act, but we don't interrogate. And because of that, we run the risk of our equitable practices seeming a bit hokey. I'm not saying that it is, but I'm saying because we're like, okay, I acknowledge that this exists. I don't even think about like, why does it exist? I'm just like, we gotta do something. We gotta, we gotta do something today because it was brought to my attention that it exists. And so as a result of that, I have practice, but it's individual, it's immediate, and ultimately it's unsustainable because it's just a reaction and it's not something that's always well thought out. Policy. Policy is systemic long-term, but it can also become stagnant. This is when we acknowledge, we interrogate, we acknowledge the results of our interrogation, and then we create action. Ain't that dope, right? Like when you really think about it, right? Like, okay, I acknowledge there's a problem. Let me interrogate and see why the problem exists. Then I acknowledge my findings because there's nothing worse than finding out why a problem exists and then not accepting the results, right? There's nothing worse than saying, honey, it's your fault that our relationship is terrible and then we do the interrogation and it's really my fault but i'm saying like no but it's still your fault like we're not gonna get anywhere right if i can't acknowledge the results of my interrogation and then i create action the problem with policy is is that if we wait for policy to act then we're creating equity deferred because we're telling our students we're working on this policy that's going to benefit you, but the student is saying, but I need that policy to benefit me today. And so we have to be careful not to get so caught up in that policy uh, cycle that we're not actually doing the things that we need to do for our students in the moment. And then ethos or culture, sustainable, 
it's evolving, it's a way of being, and it's iterative. I'm constantly going through that cycle of acknowledge, interrogate, act, acknowledge, interrogate, act, to the point where it just is a part of what we are doing. I'm never satisfied. It's just the way that we do things either individually or the way that we're doing things as a community, as a, as a, as a system, right? And, and the great thing is, is I'm seeing some familiar faces on here. I know some of you actually do this as a part of your work, right? Like you're always iterative. You're always looking to go the next step. Okay, we did this, but what's the next step after doing that, right? Because equity, like many other things in our lives, is ever evolving. It's ever growing. All right. Let me move to here. And this, this is all I'm going to say for the rest of the time. Then we'll, we'll go to, to questions. I use this for as an example of grading. But I want you all to think about doing the same exercise as it relates to supervision, right? So I did this for uh, a group of teachers. And I said, OK. An example of equity practice is saying something like, no student, uh, students who don't turn in an assignment in my class, instead of receiving a zero, they'll receive a 50. And I'm doing that so that they're, they're not so far away from a passing grade, right? I'm just, it's an equity practice. School policy says any assignment that is not turned in has to receive a zero grade. School policy takes my equity practice out of my hand. I can't do anything. So I adjust my equity practice and I say, 50% of all points for assignments are based on participation. And 50% is based on completion. So if you were in class when the assignment was assigned, you get 50% just for being in class that day. And then if you do the assignment, you'll get the other 50%. That is my equity practice. But again, that's what I do in my classroom. My co-teacher might not do that in their classroom. So now we're proposing this policy for our school that any assignment not turned in can receive up to 50% at the teacher's discretion. And then ethos is as a community of teachers, we just decide, hey, nobody is failing this year. I don't care what we gotta do, every last one of our students pass. What I would ask you to do as I stop sharing is think about this in your programs as it relates to supervision. Like what is a supervision task that everybody has to do? What's an equity practice that we can start employing? What is an equity policy that we can work towards? And then how can we make this a part of our culture to where whether the policy exists or not, we know we're gonna get a certain outcome because we have all adopted this equity mindset, this equity way of being in, 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 in our program. So I will stop there uh, and, oh look, state performance assessments make it harder than it needs uh, for many. I love that. All right, this is my first time looking at the chat. I appreciate y'all making comments in the chat as I've been uh, talking. Thank you, Dr. Onanuju. I was so inspired by your presentation. I could hear other folks taking screenshots as I was of your slides. It was really exciting. Um, so yes, we have about, yeah, I see an applause here too. Thank you so much. Um, so we have about 15 minutes for question and answer. And we also just want to hear from people and see what your ideas and thoughts are and reactions. I have um, the out of our control part of your slides. You know, some things are not in our control. You're working on changing school policy, which is very difficult, but certainly easier than state policy. And as we move to more and more testing and more and more hoops for teacher candidates to have to jump through, we are discouraging both financially and academically many students um, that we want in our programs. So what? Any ideas? I mean, it, it seems like it's taken on a life of its own. Miss Ross, uh, I, I think that's a great question. I, I will tell you the one, because I've I seen it here in the chat. I'll tell you the one that really bothers me. And I'm, I'm so thankful that the state of California has made some changes uh, to it recently. But that's the CSET, right? I can't tell you how many of 
of our candidates get tripped up by the CSET and it's like, I'm on my third or my fourth try. You know, for me, the, the policy piece is what just happened, right? Like, can we find a way to get rid of the CSET? But one of the things that we started doing in our program is like, why aren't we providing like free, like prep for all of our students? And then why after a certain number of times they take the test, like why aren't we paying for their tests, right? Like, is there a way for us to create funding to pay for their tests and to create funding to actually support them, right? If this person needs a personal tutor, let's get them a personal tutor. If they need just a group session, like we went from saying, okay, the CSET is on you by yourself, you study, you pass by yourself to saying, okay, day one, what can we start doing day one to get you prepared to take this test so that if you have to take it twice, you don't have to take it three times. Or if you got to take it three times, you ain't got to take it six times because we know that this is something that has been getting in the way, right? So that that, that would be an example of, of like us doing everything that we can to provide our students what they need, despite of the fact that the policy was lagging way, way, way behind what was really needed and happening on the ground. We've got some great peer tutoring. Uh, we provide it through peer tutoring of their cohort as well as some tutors on the UCSB campus. But the state test that California started with um, PACT many years ago that turned into EdTPA, a national thing. Ay, ay, ay. Yes, yes. Nicole then threw a boulder at me. Um, <laughs> here, here's what I would say. I think when we talk about neurodiversity, uh, when we talk about, you know, making what we are providing to our candidates more accessible, I think we start building in different opportunities to express what you're learning. And so I think when it comes to doing this work, one of the great things about teaching is, is Teaching is about relationship before it's about anything else. I truly believe that. Uh, and so if teaching is about relationship before it's about anything else, then individually, as I get to know each one of my students, I can make a decision as a supervisor how I'm going to evaluate their learning based on what their individual strengths are. Sometimes I think we fall into the trap of wanting to standardize everything because admittedly, it makes our life easier. If everybody takes the test the same way, it makes it easier for me to grade. But sometimes if we're really going to embrace this idea of living and breathing equity, then that means that we have to also be willing to accept the fact that our jobs got a, a little bit harder. And I'm the type of person where I say like, if, if it gets too hard for me to do, I can cook pretty good. Y'all taste my barbecue. Y'all will say like, you might as well open up a restaurant. So that's my that's my plan B. When the equity get too hard, I'm gonna be flipping these slabs every day. And I think that we all have to adopt that mindset of, hey, this is just what the work calls for. Rosemary, I see your hand. Thank you for patiently waiting. Oh, no, no, Rash. I was just gonna kind of tag on to what you were talking about, about um, amplifying students' strengths when we're assessing their work. And then um, I, I am a supervisor, but I also teach an intro to education class. And I like break that third wall and just tell them, okay, so this assignment is set up this way so that you all have options for how you show me what you learned. And so like that's part of the conversation I'll have with my teacher candidates as well is if we're, you know, how are you gonna know what they learned? Cause a lot of times that assessment piece is tough for them to come up with and helping them come around with different ideas of how their different students can um, show their learning, even if they don't all um, write super easily or fluently. Um, you know, are there different ways? That's always a question I ask my teacher candidates is, are there different ways that your, your students can show you that they got what, what you needed them to get? And then, if we apply that to our candidates and our college students as well, 
Um, I, I've had really great success with, with just approaching it in that way and kind of modeling and explaining how certain things are set up to the teacher candidate so that they can then employ it in their classrooms. And they've, it's almost like you're giving them a gift because they are like, you mean I don't have to do it just this one way. And um, so I just wanted to, I was just amplifying what you were saying. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, John, yes. However, let, let me say this, um, cause this is my brand of equity today. I de-emphasize assignments and emphasize learning in, in, in all of my courses. Now, what do, you, what do I mean by that? I, I am so irritated by students who come into my class and they want to have conference with me, not because they are interested in what we are learning, but they wanna get the exact parameters of the assignment right. So I spend 15, 20 minutes talking to them about like, how to dot all their I's and cross all their T's as it relates to the assignment. And at the end of the day, I'm always wondering, are you learning or are you only here to get good grades? Like, are you only here to do the assignment in the way that I want to do the assignment? And because you're not learning. And then what you find out as supervisors is when they get into the classroom and it's time to actually do and put into practice what they're being taught, they don't know anything. And so I think we have to rethink what it means to be able to demonstrate a minimum standard because our students have been professionalized in the process of being students. And so they're not in our classrooms to learn, but in our classrooms to do the things that are required of them to get the grade that they want so that they look good. And I'm, I'm really trying to like from an equity place is say like demonstrate learning to me, not demonstrate your ability to follow instructions and complete an assignment. Um, and, and many times there are some of our students who are really good, like they're learning a lot in our programs, but because we're, we're focused on our minimum standards, we're not giving them an opportunity to really express to us all that they're learning because they're just doing these assignments. So I just got to get this assignment done and then I got to go to the next class and you get in the, stuck in that rat race and, and learning is unfortunately the thing that we sacrifice the most. I, I hope that makes, makes sense. Michael, I see your hand kind of pop up there. Yeah, I'm in relationship to what you're saying, sir, um, a lot has to do first with the individual kid, individual student their background, uh, what has happened in their lives and so on and so forth, how they come to your class prepared or unprepared. Then the other thing that we as teachers deal with is instructional strategy. Which instructional strategy is going to put the emphasis and the responsibility on the shoulders of the student what I usually say is I take myself off stage and I put my students on stage. Then the responsibility for them to perform their learning is on their shoulders. The, the, the chat is going, Mike just dropped the, uh, a bomb on us. I don't even know where to go. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna, <laughs> uh, Amy, I second and third exactly what you're saying. Um, we, we have to recognize, and I want you to say something to this too, but we have to recognize that education possibly is the biggest gatekeeper, right? And, and even us equity-minded folks, we fall into the trap of creating like being gatekeepers to our students. And, and we don't even realize it until somebody brings it up and we'd be like, oh, I, I didn't even realize that I was doing that. So we, you mind just giving us a few comments on that, Amy? Yeah, um, first off, I just want to say thank you so much. This, your, your talk has been amazing. <laughs> um, I find that um, 
no, no, no blaming of, in, of, of anybody here, <laughs> but in looking at myself, I see myself also, you know, perpetuating the things that um, I don't want to perpetuate, but that's because I feel like I have to, or because it's part of the system or something like that. And it, it is really troublesome to me to see now, as I look through, you know, the, the objectives and the syllabus and all of these other components, how many elements there are in these learning experiences that are just sort of, um, it, it's almost run, it's, it's like a business meeting, like, please do this, please do that, I'm delegating this. And it is frustrating because now I'm noticing that there are so many pieces that are almost meant to quote unquote, weed out students or to pit them against each other sometimes and it it's so tough to to see that and to know that um i myself am, am part of that <laughs> yeah a amy it's like we're training them to be mechanics but saying you can't get your mechanics license unless you can make an omelet yeah <laughs> Exactly. And, and 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 we we get mad when they they're, they're like, what does making an omelet have to do with me being a mechanic? And we're like, it, it's you just have to do it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Nicole, the most successful candidate contestants on Black Academics have been contestants who have been able to make connections with the students over and over again. That is the one thing that we have seen is that the candidates and, and keep in mind they get 30 minutes before they start teaching to meet their students for the first time and so in that 30 minutes they got to do something to be able to create that rapport um but then that rapport continues into the lesson uh so that was that was the first uh element the second element because we did it on zoom is the educators that were best able to deal with the different hiccups of zoom were successful. So the ones that understood that like not all technology is created equally. So my, my whatever I'm going to have my students doing can't be too technology because I know you, you all have seen this. I'm sure like some of my students are on their cell phone. Some of my students are on a Chromebook or a, a device that does not have the capability. So I can't have them go to this website and that website and that because then they begin to get disengaged, right? And so those are the, the two biggest things, the ones that built the rapport and then the ones who were able to navigate the technology because they understood where all of their students were coming from and not just the ones who had uh, MacBooks. Uh, let's see. For the sake of timing, if it's okay, let's take one final question and then we will give you a huge thank you, Ijoma. This has just been an awesome presentation. So let's go for a final question. And I'm just curious, I thought Jeannie, you might've had your hand up at one point. I'm not sure, maybe you were just stretching. Okay, final question. Then how about a final comment from Dr. Oh. Ms. Dr. Amy is, is holding her hand up now. Okay, I am. I'm. I have one. I thought of one. So, the state has a lot of restrictions on what teachers have to go through. Not only C set, C best, but the teacher performance assessments. And I'm just wondering how much flexibility we're giving candidates. I know. I already know the answer to that. I mean, um, there's some very definite guidelines that they have to follow. So how do we make them successful? That, that, that's, that is a very, uh, that, that's the, the, the question of the hour. I will say that there are some, some good programs out there that are doing a good job with uh, their students. Uh, recently, I've had an opportunity to do some, uh, uh, connect with Alder Graduate School of Education if you all haven't, I think they have a, a really good model for how they're pushing non-traditional candidates through and, and getting them prepared. But I also think that, uh, you know, for some of our students, we have to 
show them the charter school opportunities that are out there, right? Or the private independent school opportunities that are out there. And the reason why I say that is because I don't want our students to think that if they are struggling getting through the credentialing process, that that means that they can't be teachers. There are other opportunities for them to engage in the teaching profession as they're working on their credential. And so sometimes we have to say, hey, I think this private school might be a good opportunity for you, or hey, here's a charter school system that may be a good opportunity for you giving them every and all opportunity because, listen, when I did my dissertation, this was one of the things that I found in my dissertation that I felt was pretty amazing. Every individual, every participant in my dissertation said the reason why they became teacher is because they got the itch. Somebody put them in front of children long enough to where they couldn't resist it anymore. And they was like, I gotta, I gotta become a teacher because like, this is what I wanna do for the rest of my life. And so I really feel like if we can get them to get the itch, then they can persevere through the challenges of, of trying to get their credential uh, and giving them other opportunities to engage in the profession, I think is kind of the way to go. And with that, if we could all please express our appreciation for this amazing presentation. By Ijoma Onanuju. Thank you so much, Dr. Onanuju. Um, we, um, I, I apologize, I didn't give you a two minute break before your 130 sessions. Um, but yeah, I'm seeing lots of appreciation for you all. So thank you for coming. You all have a good week.